But good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's with great, really great pleasure uh, that we uh, we have Carl Berge uh, on the line today. And now Carl is the founder of um, Comfort Hoof Care and Safe Cows. Uh, the wonderful thing about Carl, and I've seen it happen the last time he was out here, and I call it a Carlism, um, and I've spoken to his wife about this, is his ability to be able to go on farm and talk to the owner, the manager and the staff and listen to what's happening on farm. So actually uh, ingest, I guess, the problems that they're having and take notes and and ingest this information. And then and then at the end of the uh, end of the day, give real solutions and real practical solutions on how to uh, how to uh, how to look after cattle better. And and a lot of that is around great hoof health because as we say in rugby, they can't run without legs. And, uh, and cattle can't run without hooves and they can't move without hooves and we need our cattle to be moving. So Carl is a great presenter in that, in that regard because he listens. Uh, one thing that rattles around in my head often uh, when, I, when I think of Carl is it's got to be easy. You know, if it's not easy, uh, it won't happen. And something that we're trying to do with Carl's help with, uh, at Eagle Direct is make things easy and hoop health being easy for you. And, uh, and that's getting the right equipment, so having the right right tools to be able to, um, to trim animals and the right consumables um, to be able to look after blocking animals, et cetera. But I think the big part of that, and this is where Carl is so good, is in the, uh, is in the training. So really looking after you, not only just selling, selling equipment, but, but looking after the training side of that. So Carl's been very active of coming, coming to Australia and doing lots of training here for the last... How long, Carl? I was trying to think. Fifteen years. Uh, eighteen years. Eighteen years. Eighteen years coming to Australia. So, Carl has sat there on many farms and listened to the problems uh, that we face down here in the Southern Hemisphere, and that's why he's such a powerful resource for us. I've got Dean Fry sitting beside me uh, here today. Who's Dean's part of our uh, part of our Eagle Direct team? So, welcome, Dean. Thanks, Mike. And I think, uh, and even the people that we've got online here today, we've got some really smart people online, and and I'm really looking forward to the question and answer after Carl finishes uh, presenting. So, obviously, we've we've done a bit of, uh, I guess, listened to what the market's doing and spoken to Carl about it, and especially that that we're all talking about a hot summer, but um, Carl's just talking about uh, trimming hooves out there today and having a couple of hot days. So they've just gone through uh, their, their summer, the Northern Hemisphere summer, and we're coming into it in the Southern Hemisphere. So Carl's been through this summer. There's some great learnings, always learning and always um, adopting what we learn and how to make it really practical. So, um, yeah, I'd like to thank Carl for his time. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Carl. There's a, there is a question and answer um, uh, uh, bubble. So just throw your questions and answers here, and then we're just going to throw it out to a bit of debate um, or a question and answer thereafter, which is always a powerful, a powerful thing. We're also recording this as a resource as well. So uh, if you've got any people that want to re-watch it, then that's uh, that's available also on our on our YouTube channel. So Carl, they're all yours, and we're going to be quiet for the next little while while we listen to your presentation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mike, and and uh, thank you, Dean, and and welcome everybody. It's it's my pleasure to be uh, talking about this uh, heat stress impacts of health, and and uh, uh, it's interesting when you travel around the world. Uh, you know, you go to the Middle East, or you or you go to, as an example, you go to Pakistan, where where the temperatures are 40, 38 to forty degrees, and the nights never get below. 32 degrees or sometimes 35 and how do they keep cows going and and that's that's what i want to talk about a little bit why does heat stress impact hoof health with that so you can see here it's it's just a a little bit a promotion here but you know actually here on the on the right hand side this was actually australia we did uh some years ago we did uh a workshop at Lepping Pastoral Company after the uh, Australia Dairy Conference, and it was well attended. But understanding what's happening, I think it's it's real crucial, and we have to have simple solutions. And that one, that's what I want to talk about. 
when we look at lameness around the world, and and I Dean and I talked about this, New Zealand, Australia, 8.3%. Well, a lot of that is probably not recorded. And 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 it's probably higher today. This was uh in 2015, you can see here. And and you can see here in Wisconsin, there was a top 60 hertz. We're at 13.2%. They averaged 41 kilos of milk per cow per day. The average around the world is still around 20, 25%. And you can see here that one of the highest one is over in, New, uh, in Northeast USA, which was over 50%. So what's what's lameness costing you? And, and this is studies that came out of the UK. One of them came out of the US. But when you look at it, you can see here, digital dermatitis is not real common in Australia, but a white line, 370 kilos of milk, a sole ulcer, 570 kilos of milk, a lame cow, 360 kilos of milk. But I think what, what it really comes down to, that's, that's what I see when it comes, when you get to the farms. With digital dermatitis, 20 extra days to get that cow and calf or, or, or that two-year-old and calf. White line disease, 30 days, extension of the calving interval. So loss is even longer. And then the increased culling risk, you can see here with the white line, 354 days less in the herd or with the so loss even more. And, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But when you look at here, this, this is a lame cow. And the key of here is who identifies her Okay, who is responsible for the treatment and what is done for prevention? Okay, and, and you can see here how she was holding up that foot. That, this is very typical. And in this case, this was actually a digital dermatitis lesion. But it, it's, it, I, I think those are the things, the protocols we have to have on the farm. Who is responsible to identify her and who is responsible for the treatment? And we're going to talk more about the importance of that. So when we look at where cows get lame, soil ulcers in grazing situation, that's very, very uncommon. Okay. White lines, that's that's going to be in the on the grazing farms. That's going to be the, the majority of the lesions that I see when I'm when I'm in uh, Australia working with grazing farms or even in the over in the UK. Toe ulcer, anything in the toe here is a toe ulcer. And we'll get we'll come back to this. Digital dermatitis will be back there and then foot rot in, in between. So when we look at soul ulcers, this is a good picture of a soul ulcer. And for me, that's the standing disease, okay? And I, I remember uh, being in Chile uh, probably seven, eight years ago, and we visited two farms. The one farm, grazing farms. One of them had only so, uh, white line lesions. The first farm, we went to the second farm. The first three cows, lame cows, we looked at all had soul ulcers. The reason was is the farm was using a feed pad to feed the, uh, the cattle some, some extra feed on the feed pad. And that's why the standing disease causes soul ulcers. And we got good research today is that when cows stand longer, soul ulcers go up. And there was actually some good research done by Dr. Chair Kramer. White line disease is the walking distance, perching in the stalls, like, like in the free stalls in the summer with the heat. And we'll see a picture after that. And then the other thing here would be stockmanship or cow handling. And that's that's a good one from my good friend, uh, Neil Chesterton down under. Uh, you know, the, the cow handling, the cow movement is so important, especially in, in freestyle facilities, but also in grazing facilities. And then here we got the toe ulcers. For me, that's a standing, a wear, or an inflammation disease. And we'll come back to that. And then we have digital dermatitis, hygiene immunity, and foot rot is immunosuppression and abrasion. I'm not going to get more into that, but what we have to look at here is soul ulcers and white line lesion, white line disease, most prevalent claw lesions today, okay? For me, what I do is I do see soul ulcers at lower levels in a lot of the herds at well-managed farms. 
where we do good functional trimming, we can prevent it. Where we have comfortable freestyle and good heat abatement. Yeah, you know, uh, on grazing farms, like I said, if they don't feed on the feed pad, if we don't feed a lot, then, then we don't see it there either. White line lesions are increasing in larger herds. And it's because uh, uh, cows are uh, larger groups. They, they move, they have to move further. So they're doing more repetitive motion by walking, walk longer walking distances. And the other thing is uh, with the increase in herd size, sometimes the, the, the yard or the milking parlor area is not big enough for, for, the, uh, for the group of cows. And, and so there's more pushing going on in that. We'll see a video later on. So what's the reason? What's happening? And here you can see here, we're going to watch this count a little bit, but what everybody needs to remember is 40 to 45 respiration rate is normal for the cow. Okay. When we look at it, heat stress is greater than 60. Danger zone is over 70. And you can see here, this cow, she, she is panting. And, and, and it's not going to be long before she stands up. And, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So these this are other things uh, that when I travel around the world, very, very common here that in this, this in certain areas, cows spend a lot of time along the headlocks because they have water there where they get cooled. Even though there is fans back here, they still spend, spend, spend time too much here. So it's ventilation is a huge important part how that's all set up. And we're going to talk about more. And I know the Eagle Direct team is very on top of what's happening with, with ventilation. And I must tell everybody that in the last three, four years, the information and the progress we made on ventilation and cooling cows, it's like, it's incredible. It's incredible. We're, we'll see the results. So for me, this is a typical, uh, this could be two things heat stress or bad free stalls. But with heat stress, a lot of times the cows, when they're too hot, they stand ha half in, half out. What we see then in this case, we see a lot more uh, white line lesions. The same thing here, okay? So you, you can see here, none of these barns has fans in here. You now these are, these are, these pictures haven't been taken that long ago, but I know this, particular facility now has fans in and 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 uh and this one over here i'm not sure so the other thing is there is no cooling system that keep cows cool in this situation and what i want to show you here is this is a place i visited and and they wanted they wanted assistant and and solving their white line problem and they wanted assistant but you can't have twice the size of group and put them in a, or, or a, a certain size, a certain more cows and put them in the same holding area. So they were really paying for it in the summertime with low production because cows would get overheated there, took too long to get them through the parlor. So all of those type of things. The other thing is when cows are hot, too overheated, they don't get freely on the, on the rotary. They don't want to, they don't want to move. I don't want to move when it's too hot. Another thing here is, this was in, in uh, Colombia, several years, a beautiful grazing area. At nine o'clock, everybody, 100% of the cows were lying. So they come out of the milk, from away from milking about seven. And by nine o'clock, everybody was laying. And what you can see here, by 11, 11 o'clock, it was only 20 C. There's only a few cows laying down. All the rest of them, some of them were grazing, but most of them are just standing there because I didn't go and check the respiration rate, but I, I would bet it was over 60, you know, and it was just 20, 20 C, but it was kind of humid. So to understand. And then the other thing here is just uh, uh, in August, 20th of August, I, I was in Switzerland and you can see at a small farm we proud with brown Swiss it was 26 degrees right right at the time when I took this picture. 
And you can see here the low producers, they're kind of grazing, nibbling on the grass. But then I walked a few steps further and the, all the, the five or eight high producers of this 20 cow herd, they were standing in the shade and you could tell the respiration rate was above 60. So they were searching shade cool. They were say, searching that. So, so what, what I want everybody to understand is on the left-hand side here, when we would take the hoof capsule off, the corium is what underneath it. The corium is what supports the cow, is what grows the horn. And, and there's two different pictures here. There is, there is uh, the healthy one on top, and then there is the inflamed one on, on, the, on the bottom. And, and what we have to understand is, I have a good example here using a thumb. When a cow stands, we, re, the, we restrict the, the circulation. And if she stands long enough, it equals inflammation. And, and so you can see here, if I put pressure on my thumb, okay, it gets wide on the bottom. That's actually what's happening with the cows as they stand for too long, when they stand too long, okay? And, 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 and so what's happening is eventually we cause, it causes inflammation, inflammation, results in poorer horn quality, uh, maybe sometimes even accelerated horn growth and 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 so on. So what we what I want to go on is uh, with with this is the fundamental understanding of inflammation. Everybody needs to understand that swelling, pain, redness and fever is normal when cows calf. Is a norm, it's needed to drive the birthing process. Part of the metabolic, and it's part of the metabolic adaptation to lactation. And that's from Barry Bradford in, 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 uh, uh, at the TC conference in 21. So, so the other thing we know is, so it's normal to occur during calving, but the outcome from that is observed six to eight weeks later in the class. So if something goes wrong around calving time, so we get a double whammy. So if we get a double whammy and, and then day 60, day 70, we have lame cows in, in the mob. And, and I want to explain that a little bit better. So part of that is standing. We know that cows right before calving stand a little bit more, heifers even more, like heifers stand up to... Uh, first calf heifers, the two days before calving, stand up to 90 minutes more than the than average cow in the same from research. So what happens when we have inflammation? The inflammation and the sequence leading to claw horn resorption lesions. So the mechanical overload leads to pain, inflammation. So that's from calving, extended standing, too much wear, lack of hoof trimming, over trimming, a lot of those type of thing, things. Pain may lead to tendonitis and compromised movement. So adjusting the cows or the animals with just the movement to compensate for the pain. And that damages the tissue even more. This is even worse if the claws are not functional. The cumulative damage is done to the internal organs. So to the, the bone development, the horn production tissue and the vascular system. And what we have, what we see then is, and we have some good example, we see extra bone accumulation. So bone spurs or bone exactosis. And when you can see here, this is a pretty normal pedal bone. So actually, if, if, if I criticize it, it has just a little bit extra bone back here, but this is, the rest of it looks really, really normal. When we get to the next picture here, you can see here, this is out of a cow. So it modifies the bone inside. Uh, generally, there's some bone loss that you can see there's a lot of bone build up and that's from the inflammation. That's the uh, interaction between the mechanical overload aging neovessel formation and pain management. So how they adjust to walk with the pain. 
So the next thing I want to show you is here, I've got some really nice pedal bones. And, and you can see here, these. this is the plantar surface, so the sole surface. And this is a 12-month-old animal. This is an 18-month-old animal. And this is a 24-month-old animal. And what I could see right away is already on the 24 months old, you see a little bit of roughness of, of, of the plantar surface compared to the other ones. You also see a little more opening of the bone around the outside. Now, I can't tell you exactly where it came from. Uh, uh, for sure, I, I knew where these came from, but I was not quite sure. But when you go to the next one here, I know where this one came from. This came out of a, a, a second lactation cow that had something went wrong, a calving, and, and she died on the farm, and I was able to collect the feet and, and, and then collect the bones. And you can see here, something happened here. There's a lot of bone build up there, and you can see how much rougher that, that gets. So this all influences how the horn is produced afterwards. This influences the horn quality. And, and the, the thing about this is when we do good trimming, when we do good prevention, when we do the things that we're going to talk about later, we see less of that. I, I found pedal bones out of older cows that were almost normal. But we have to prevent disease or we have to treat lameness quickly. Because if we delay the lameness treatment, uh, again, she she adjusts that movement. So here, here, this was an interesting one. Farm I was at today, several a couple of years ago, they brought me this heifer. It was fifty days fresh, and she you can see she had hemorrhaging on the front left, rear left. It, this is not a good picture on the rear right. She had pneumonia three days before calving. So she had inflammation from the morning. She's calved, you know. So so those things happen. And but I can tell you, she wasn't crimped before because at this farm where they race, they come off a of dry lots. So so we don't trim them unless they look like they need they they need it. And sometimes we don't get to all of them. But you can see here, the damage on this this animal is already done because we trimmed her at that point in time. She really never became lame. But I know there is already damage to that pedal bone underneath it. Okay? So the, the permanent damage with severe lesion is irreversible. So like here, we've got a really bad sole ulcer or a really bad white line. And probably because we didn't come to it right away. So, so we know that that affects everything internally. It, it will grow a normal hoof wall again, but some of the other... Uh, the sole horn, or even in this case here, the white line horn might not be as strong. So the damage is done. The other thing is the damage is done to the pedal bone. So again, when we look on the left-hand side on the healthy claw, okay, we have a convex dorsal wall. We have a healthy pedal bone. We have that healthy corium, the healthy lamina, and and. That convex wall is very normal for healthy claws. So, so when when I see car, convex claws, which I saw a lot of them today, I I don't have a lot of lameness. But then when I go to the concave dorsal wall, you can see here. This is not necessarily the pedal bone out of there, but that means there is internal damage there. And and if we don't prevent it from the beginning. It will always be a problem again. So it's it's always it, it's always going to come and visit us again, especially when when we have stress periods. Okay, this is a really nice video. You can see both of them here. On the left is the normal one, on the right is the damaged one. Okay, a nice open joint here, nice and everything the way it's supposed to look like. Here we can see here extra bone formation. There's a big hump. Uh, uh, part of the pedal bone is actually missing in this one. So we'll go back, go back one more time here. You can see it one more time. So this is part of the bone is missing here. The claw looks pretty normal, but the thing is the damage is done and 
she's always going to be more susceptible to lameness again, or she's going to leave the farm early. So, and, and a lot of that, in my opinion, is caused by inflammation. So what can be done for prevention? Functional uh, trimming to improve the anatomical function of the claws. So, so what, we, what we're doing today uh, from a functional trimming end of it really gets us a long ways. And, and in grazing situation, I would say the best time to do it would be as they go dry, so, so they calve in, okay? For me, there is one anatomy, so only one set of rules for trimming. You know, even though there is a lot of different ways, when you go on YouTube, a lot of different ways feet are trimmed. Uh, there's only one anatomy. There's only one way it can be done. Uh, I've been an instructor uh, for almost 25 years since 1997. And, and uh, I teach this around the world and I know it works. It, it's that farm you saw in Switzerland, they don't even know what soul ulcers are anymore today. And years ago, they had big problems with soul ulcers. Dean Fry and myself are covering Australia and New Zealand and Dean will actually do more in the future. Uh, I'll do as much as I can. And for me, all cows and heifers before calving must be assessed and trimmed if necessary. So for me, depending on the situation, one to three times per year, we need to uh, assess them for the need for trimming. Depending on the, the farm setup, I work with, with some good freestyle barns with sand bedding. But we seem like with, with the first and second lactation, we don't really have any problems doing them once a year. And, and sometimes just the back feet a second time. But as cows get older, like today, I was trimming several six, seven, eight, ninth lactation cows. And some of those come to see me every three months, but it's fun when they're not lame and before they used to be lame. For me, it's critical for the people that do the trimming for the technicians to follow the rules exactly, because that's, that's the, the, that outcome is crucial. You know, there's too much over trimming done. So here, this is what it looks like, you know, what we want to do is we want to shift the load to the toe triangle, utilizing the foundation of the anatomy, because the anatomy, uh, we don't have enough time to explain it, but the, the strongest part of the anatomy is in the toe triangle. So be right up here. And, and so shifting it up on our toes is one of the most critical parts. And, and then you can see here, we're, we're going to, the, the, the trim area, that's the way I measure, so I don't go too far back on the heel. And this is what we call modeling or dishing it out. And you can see we do a little, very little dishing uh, in the medial claw, but we do a lot more dishing on the lateral claw. And, and we know as for a fact that's what prevents the sole ulcer, especially when we can shift the weight into the toe. Now in a grazing cow, we wouldn't do as extreme unless we're gonna feed them on a feed pad for some time, so, okay? And here you can see on the right-hand side, you can see my colleague uh, works with grazing cows uh, in Colombia, and, and you can see here his nice trim. Again, he's just doing the toes and just a little bit of uh, the modeling, shortening the toes up just a little bit. And you could see before the angle wasn't quite right. And, and he's going to show it here in just a bit that, that uh, checking back to see where the angle turned out to be. And you can see the angle is a nice 52 degrees. That's what that uh, device measures. In some cases, I would prefer to have 55 because most of our front feet are 55 or more, and we have a lot less problems in the front feet. And, and here, this is actually uh, one of the farms I work with, one of the grazing farms, and that's what we do with the, with the, with the heifers before calving. We shift the weight up in the toe, we just dish them out just a little bit. But the most important part is 
to take some off the toe, to stand them up. We want to stand them up because that's how they function better. And the other thing is, if we do it before calving, they're up on their toes when they start walking. And, and in this case, we can prevent, we can save more heel and we can prevent a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, white line lesions. And here, the same thing in a, in a heifer raised in confinement, you can see here, knowing what to take off, knowing what to leave on. I didn't touch this toe. I didn't touch this toe because it was already right. But we dished the outside claw out. We dished the outside claw out. And that's all I'm going to do about trimming. So when we have heat stress, we have two types of lameness. The one is the immediate lesion. So you can see here, okay, a little black spot, a little black spot. So when we have hot weather, we have an increase in bacterial growth. Any imperfection of the horn, especially in the white line, allows bacteria to enter and cause an infection. And there's always pus there. And, and you can see here, this one was, was uh, a, you know, a front, uh, front left and right way back at the heel. Uh, those things happen. And and it's it's broke open. She probably was lame for a couple of three days. This one in the toe, she wasn't lame very long because because in the toe they show it that much faster. Uh, and 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 so it's so important to identify those lame cows daily and and look after them daily. Every farm needs to have a way to look after lame cows, even though the hoof trimmer is coming in. Once a week is not good enough for the hoof trimmer to be on the farm. When we look at what the farms do that do in-house trimming, we're so much better at taking care of lame cows there, especially if we have well-trained technicians. The next type of heat stress is lingering lesions that occur about two months later, okay? So what we had around the 20th of August, for us is late uh, and and then uh, for around the 1st of September. We're gonna see some extra lameness by the middle of October into the first, second week of November. It's, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll show that uh, right away. The primary cause there is inflammation. It takes time to develop into actual lesions. So that's the stuff that doesn't come right away. It can manifest with other circumstances, wet weather, second part of heat stress, or having time. The better the anatomical clock condition is during heat stress, the less lesions develop. And I see that with my farm because we're very aggressive in early midsummer to make sure that the dry cows are done, that the older cows are done. We actually, in the last couple, three years, we went through the summer really, or even the fall with a lot less lameness than we've been doing in the past. But we cannot trim our way out of overheated cows. And that's the important thing. And, and this is a really good, really good slide. You can see here from 2002, Nigel Cook, uh, this was on one of the farms, that the black line is temperature humidity index, and the blue line is hoof lesions. And you can see here, that there's a two months lag time every year, a two months lag time between the peak of the lesions and uh, between the uh, highest temperature and then the lesions when they occur. The other thing here is the uh, uh, this is from a larger farm that I consult with, and and what you what you can see here, okay, October, oh, that's kind of October into November. We're kind of coming out of the out of the lameness, but you can see here in July, August, and September, it increases. The, the blue lines are white line lesions. The, the, the red ones here are, 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 are soul ulcers. So, so the, 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 the dark red ones here. So you can see we're doing a, quite a good job of preventing soul ulcers at this farm. It's actually the digital dermatitis that's, that's, that's uh, kind of following that a little bit too. But what I want you to really pay attention to when you look at days in milk down here, 50 to 100 days. So a lot of the digital dermatitis is diagnosed at mid-lactation trim and also a few soul ulcers and some white lines.
But what really bothers me here is all these lame cows, all these white line lesions in the first 100 days. Production is right down the tube when, when those things happen. And, and I remember, you know, what we did is we actually, we actually implemented something different here. We, we said, okay, let's check the older cows. And a lot of these, when we went back, were fourth, third, fourth, fifth lactation cows. So we're actually giving them a special checkup. This was another study, uh, some 4,000 cows up in Northern uh, Japan. Uh, all with dairy count brackets. And what you can see here, the gray line is the temperature. The red line uh, and the low temperature, the orange line is the high temperature over two years. Look at look at what happens here. September, October, soil ulcers are high. Next year, they weren't quite as high. Okay, maybe better trimming was done. But the other thing to look at here is when you look at on days in milk, look at where all the soul ulcers happen. Already soul ulcers happen in the first 30 days after calving. Now I know it in this particular area, a lot of times, because the hoof trimmers travel uh, long distances, they trim all the cows two times or three times a year. And, and but that would affect that because sometimes it's not perfect for those cows. And, and you know, when we look at 4,000 cows, again, all those things happen in early and then they tailor off in later lactation. And when it comes to white line lesion on, on the same study, very, very similar. You can see here those peaks, right? Peaks up again in August and September, you know, and, and, and go down. Actually, there was the, the, the white lines were higher the, the, in 17 than they were in 16. So something shifted. Maybe they did a better job of modeling. But the next thing to understand is here, what's happening to a cow, okay? When we look at here, this is some work that, that Nigel Cook did in 2014. The interesting thing is when the cow lays down, okay, as time goes on and their body temperature goes from like 30, 38.2, up to 38.8 or 38.9, as soon as that body temperature gets up, she stands up, okay? The body temperature increases a half a C per hour in heat stress, cows are laid down. The other thing to understand is maybe in Australia, because it's warmer, maybe it's not 38.8, maybe it's more like 30, 39.3, it's the, the, the I, I notice myself when I travel to warmer climates, cows have a little higher threshold when it comes, comes to heat. They can deal with it. But the other thing here is, you know, they will lay down once that body temperature is, is down again to that 30, 38.2 or 38.3. Okay, that's when, they, that's when they lay back down. But the, the thing we have to understand is that it takes two times as long to cool them down and what takes them to heat up. So that's, that's why it's important to have good, good ventilation, good, good, good heating system, uh, good, good cooling system. So a little bit more here, when we look at BTUs, BTUs is uh, heat measured, okay? We as a resting human, we produce about 200 BTU. A cow producing 27 kilos of milk, produces about 2,500 BTUs, 36 kilo, about 4,250. And a cow producing 45 kilos of milk produces uh, 6,000 BTUs per hour, okay? So when you compare that and, and uh, you can use a hair dryer, a hair dryer on low is like a low producing cow a hair dryer on high is a high producing cow. And what I want everybody to remember is when you bring those high producing cows in the yard for milking, or when you walk out in a barn and it's a group of high producing cows, there, there is more heat present because they're producing more heat, okay? So this study that was done by Nigel Cook in 2006 on one of my farms uh, is was quite interesting. So, 
session one, so that goes from coolest to hardest. And, and we did this four months in a row, the same group of cows. And you can see here, we measured laying down time. We measured total time standing. We measured feeding time, milking time, okay? And the interesting thing to see is that, you know, with with the, with the hardest time, with the hardest session, there was three hours less laying down time, over three hours less laying down time. So more standing, not more feeding. When you look at the feeding, wasn't wasn't really feeding is right in the ballpark, just standing around and not doing anything. And when they're standing, you know, we got good records on this. The lame cow showed up. This was in September. A late lame cow showed up in in early November, early to mid November. Quite quite an interesting study, and that that got us thinking. That got everybody thinking more about what we need to do. So for me, standing in the milking centers is always overheating the cows. No, you can see here, no shade. This actually has shade, but the cows were crowded in there. There was no air movement. Okay. Uh, this was a grazing facility. Uh, all of these were grazing facilities, you know, and and what we have to think about is is shade is probably number one, uh, and then air is probably number two. And I think Dean and and Mike can maybe even talk a little more about it. But sometimes, in some cases, when we kind of trying to wet the cows a little bit, it actually makes them harder because if we don't soak them right to the core of the, of the uh, of the body, it actually keeps the heat in. And that's something to, to understand. The other thing here is when you look at grazing cows, time budgets, okay? So the, the thing here is, is you, they spend less time laying down, okay? About eight hours, nine hours of laying down. And, that, and that's... Uh, that's from Cook in 2006. I think that probably came out of the UK. But the other thing is we need to think about what time do we do the milking? The hardest time of the day. Cows are crowded in the yard. No shade. No cooling. Cows move back to the pasture overheated. First of all, an overheated cow is not going to lay down. She's also not going to eat. So that's why we see sometimes lameness happening two months later. And it's the same thing in the confinement facilities, okay? You know, years ago, we said, well, three hours milking time is okay. I don't think it is. I think not with high producing cows. Three hours in the yard is too long per day on three times a day milking. Uh, and and I got a good example from, from a farm that I work with. And and uh, so I would say two and a half, less than two and a half hours is, is much better with high producing cows per day, okay? So what keeps cows from overheating? Shade, airflow, wind speed, less time in the yard. So smaller mops, water, you know, exit, exit shower, less crowding, give them space. So in the Middle East, cows spend less than two and a half hours away from the pen, and that's on four times a day milking. It's fun to, this farm here, is doing 46 liters per cow on, on 20,000 cows. It's fun to go to this place because everything is taken care of. You know, lameness is at less than 5%. And I've been there and there's 50, 50 C during the day, you know, but they do everything just to make sure the, the group size is matched to the size of the parlor. So there is two turns in the parlor or in, 20 minutes, they're, they're in and out of the holding pen. And, and what can we do for prevention? So wind speed in the resting place in a freestyle barn. You can see here, uh, Nigel Cook's work, wind speed in the resting place, 1.6 to 1.7 meters a second. You know, on the really hot during peak heat, maybe up to 2.4 meters per second. And that air needs to be about 50 centimeters above the lying surface. And the other thing we also need to have is we need to have air exchanges. Okay, we need to have, get rid of some of this hot air. We can't just uh, uh, suck that hot air onto the cows. So, so and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So, so you can see here, this particular barn, 
in the last four years. Okay, you know, it's uh, on the left here, we got a tunnel system. On, on the, here, we've got a, a cross vent system. Both of these systems work exceptionally well. This is actually a hybrid system on the side. You can see the fans coming in on the side here, on both sides. I can tell you is that each one of those herd does over 42 liters. This one here is probably at 45, 46. This one is at 44. And, and they're not going down in the summertime because when they built their facilities, when they expanded, they made the right decisions to make sure that the cows would be comfortable. When I took this picture, this was uh, 32 degrees Celsius. On, that was the last, last summer. So, and again here, the Eagle Direct team can help us. And, and here you can see uh, in cooler climates, the threshold, the heat threshold is probably comes comes er, on earlier. So if we go more north, northern hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. So that's yes. what we just discussed in front of the scope of your role is concerned. What else have you been involved in with that? What else are you involved in? So okay. So, so I, I don't have a lot left here. So the other thing is two ulcers. Heat stress has an impact. Standing causes inflammation. Inflammation results in inferior horn quality. So when those cows are standing and they have inflammation, the sole horn does not have the integrity. So we have a, a softer horn because it's got blood mixed in with it. Softer horn wears more quickly. Thin sole cows make more steps because because they have, there's pain. Even cows that have inflammation make more steps. Make more steps results in more wear. More ground contact means more wear. More thin soles and more toe ulcers. And sometimes you don't see it right in the middle of the summer. You see it coming on later. You see it when you, when you get the rains in the grazing situation. And you can see here, a lot of this is ex excessive wear. Okay, you can see here. This is a grazing cow, basically wore through, okay? Here, freestyle cow, wore through. This one too, you can see where she ended up. So, so we really need to think about the whole concept, the, everything, it, that, that education, that understanding is so important. And, and the, 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 the great thing about today is we have so much more information available to us. See, when, when the rain starts, softer horn, you know, then you got the, the wet tracks, more abrasive. Right away, now we have thin soles. You know, thin soles go up. So, so all those things, uh, you know, these are these are these are problems with with uh, grazing farms, but there are also problems with confinement farms because it works the same way. If we don't cool them nicely, uh, it happens exact identical. So, the action plan to resolving problems. First is being proactive, plan ahead. Education, knowledge, that's that's power. Early lameness treatment, early lameness identification, and like we said before, the prevention. So action to improve hoof, hoof health. Understanding the implications of the complete picture. What really happens to those cows? The heat stress, the re respiration rate, the body temperature going up. Okay, every farm has ways to reduce heat stress. I've been to farms where they, in, in the hottest days of the, uh, of the summer, they split the groups out at the freestyle barn. They only bring the, the, the feed alley into the, into the yard for milking. They leave the rest of them out in the barn because they know they stay cooler out in the shed than they will in the holding pen. And, and Every farm can implement some prevention strategies that, you know, people say, well, I, ca I can't do it. I don't have to help. Really, can't we do it? Because the implications, we saw the cost. And, and once they become lame this year, next year, it happens again. Next year, it happens again. It happens over and over. Or she leaves the herd. For me, when I, when I go around, the people that do it right, the results are so rewarding. Okay? So to conclude... The ultimate is to create a cooling zone, okay? We, we need to have a way to, 
to call the cows. Doesn't matter which system we were in. Okay. And and what I'm seeing is I've been going to Australia for, like I said, since 2005. And it's gotten hotter down there too. And I see more hot cows down there than I did in 2005 or 2006 and seven. That's when you were in the drought. You, you had very little problems. There was very little lameness issues there uh, uh, at that time. We need to reduce the thermal load that leads to high, uh, when we reduce the thermal load, it leads to higher dry matter intake. That's why these high producing herds, they just keep right on milking through it. An hour, hour and a half after milking, every cow is laying down in, in the sand beds. Cow showers at the exit of the milking parlor. I see that a lot in the, in the Middle East, basically just a bunch of water, uh, really heavy water going on those cows with cold water, cooling those cows down. And then they go out and walk and, and go in the, in the ventilation where, where, they, where, they, where they're eating. Ensuring fresh or push up feed is ready to go after milking. So we need fresh feed to, ready to go after milking. So when those cows come back, they eat and 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 in some places uh, then we have soaker soaker systems today the soaker systems are controlled uh, phenomenal that if the cow is not in front of it the water won't run and we need to make sure they have increased access to fresh and clean water so a lot of places I see excess water during the hot times so excess water troughs uh, part of exit or sometimes even in the in the traffic lanes to, to back to the to the sheds okay ultimately anytime we can increase line times as the uh, as shown in the data lameness goes down production goes up and that's why those high producing herds do so well big groups or large pens are are sometimes not suitable during, during that hot weather i i got one of my clients that that has has these problems Long holding vent time does not work. Overcrowding creates too much heat. Inflammation is not a problem when cows can lay down 12 plus hours a day. And that's what we saw, that's what we see is when we have 12 plus hours of laying down time in that cross vent barn and the hottest day last year, 12 and a half hours of laying down time. Those cows never went under 44 liters a day. Standing lame cows will not recover. So if the cow is lame and she stands around, she's not going to recover because there's there's no not good circulation. Even though we got a block on her, the circulation is still not as good than if she was laying down or if she was moving. So the management must fine tune the amb ambient temperature. So we must fine tune that. And here, are just a couple of KPIs. First, less than four percent of lesions in the first 60 days in milk. Actually, if we can get that to 2%, that's even better. Lactation one, we shouldn't have less than 5%. All cows are going lesion per year, less than 10%. And we're achieving that on a lot of farms today. So it's, it's it can be done. It, it's, it takes work. It takes planning. It takes an action plan. It takes teamwork, okay? When prevention succeeds, here we're at five. This is this is a this is the farm where I said they had 12 and a half hours of laying down time on the hottest hottest day of the year. Nigel Cook, two years in a row, and and uh, this farm 720 milking cows is selling one million liters of milk every month, and it's fun to be uh, in associated with a group like this because we helped plan the barn when they expand it between Nigel Cook and myself. You can see the flooring. We've got good flooring in here. So our white line lesions are, are really non-existent except those, those uh, bad horn lesions that, that come from uh, running, you can, as you can see here in this barn, okay? When these cows come out, they 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 do a little bit too much running because of the good good uh, traction on the on the floor, and that results in some extra white line lesions on this particular farm. You can see here this is normal how they go to milking, and maybe it wasn't a hot super hot day. They move a little slower when it's super hot. Right? 
This is pretty normal, okay? So we, we know we can build facilities that, that cows can do real well in, okay? We know uh, what, what happens here when you see here, okay, when these cows stand, have to wait too long, the other, the other cows weren't even all milked and we're still putting the cows, already putting the cows in the holding pen. So we're, uh, if this is a hot day, we're, we're actually overheat, we're already cooking these cows before they even get milked, you know? And, and the, those time budgets are so critical because the first cows, they'll be in that, on that rotary very quickly. And, and we just have to plan, we have to observe cows and, and we have to look after that. At the end here, animal welfare affects everybody's bottom line. And that was Nigel Cook's comment or headline on the 20, 2016 Safe Cow Symposium. Lameness is an animal welfare issue. Where will the milk buyer draw a line regarding lameness? And I think higher scrutiny, uh, it, there is more dairy farm audits. We are all responsible for, for doing this, okay? So with that, that kind of closes it up. And you can see here, it's nice to see, always see cows laying down. And, and you know, even in, in the hottest situation here, these cows, these cows will lay down because they have the airspeed over the stalls. So with that, Thank you, everybody, for listening. And, and uh, I'm certainly we're going to take some questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Carl. It's it's awesome to have your expertise and and even just your ability to to further our industry in terms of understanding lameness. So you, you've been doing this for so long and so passionate about it. Um, it's, it's fantastic to see you push the likes of the researchers and, and us in the field to uh, to want to do better. A um, couple of points in there to localise it a bit more for us, Carl, I guess, um, and some really keen, uh, key latest development sort of information about research on this. But um, the dry period. So in Australia, we, we, you know, we've got milk factories that are now you know, really wanting milk supply year round, um, as opposed to what's still going on in New Zealand, which is a very seasonal production, very spring carving dominated. So a lot of um, winter, you know, spring cows that aren't going through a heat stress period and dry period. But in Australia, we've got quite a lot of cows going through that heat stress period in dry cow period. And, and we know the work from Je Professor Jeff Dahl with what regards to happening to heat stress in dry cows. But that, that dry period, Carl, um, is so imperative for that horn that is being developed for that fresh cow. And, and like you say, the information we've got there, you know, two months after calving globally, we are seeing, you know, lameness concerns. And that is occurring because of our dry period management. And it's a, it's a huge opportunity for us to actually manage that dry period a lot better. Um, so that's that's a pretty important one. The um, the opportunity, like we've, we've got uh, Tom, uh, Tom Chamberlain from the UK, He's, he's currently doing some really interesting research on heat stress in grazing and, and house cattle. Um, and even just things like having shade, just the response of 10 degrees difference and that stopping of that loading of that temperature. Um, one thing that we have and we understand in some research is, you know, it only takes that 15 minutes in a holding yard with these cows. And like you say, with the weather the way it is, but our cows production Globally, our milk production is going up. So those cows are putting out more BTUs. We're now making a hotter cow in within a holding yard. Is 15 minutes is all it takes to raise that body temperature by one to two degrees. And we're seeing in these environments that that is now taking, it can take anywhere up to eight hours to dissipate that heat because sometimes we're not losing that heat overnight. So it's a, it's a major thing that's leading to all these reasons why we're looking at hoop health, but overall health of these animals. Well, you know, and another thing to mention, Dean, is I, I, I remember working for a farm and, and they didn't really have a, a good, they had a free, a beautiful freestyle set up for the milk cows, but not a place for the dry cows in the sheds. Yeah. And, and, and what we could see is after a while, always about, 45 to 90 days, a lot of lameness, and especially the older cows. 
And what we actually did is we implemented a checkup on those cows at the, between 30 and 45 days in the lactation, just to check up the back feet because all the lameness was in the back feet. And it was mostly uh, third lactation and over. That farm went up uh, about three and a half or four liters of milk. And basically there's almost, there's still a little bit of lameness, but it's not like it was before. I mean, I would say it was reduced by 80%, 85, 85, 80, 85%. It's just amazing. By, and it's just because they didn't have the perfect, they had a close up, uh, as close ups they were in the, in the sheds, but the dry cows were out in the paddock, you know, and, and not good cow cooling, especially in the summertime. Uh, no. It really affected those cows. So there is ways that ways it can be done, and and they would never go back and not doing that again. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of points you raised too, Carl. That uh, we we've probably evolved a bit further. And one of the key points is when you look at that information chart that Australia's at the bottom in terms of amenolaneness. We know that's not realistic because you, you can't measure what you don't record. And, and as you said, we, we just don't have the records in Australia. We're not running the dairy comp system where we literally have the trimming um, records going through and understanding what we've got. And and to be honest, uh, oh, why our system is going. So a lot of our dryland um, uh, dairy farms um, like South Gippsland and um, South, uh, South West, West Victoria, you know, a lot of those over summer are actually feedlotting uh, on feed pads. So Things like uh, sole ulcers is actually, we, we do actually see them because we, we've just got increased standing time when we're not actually, you know, grazing these these cows. So the, the other point that you've got in there in regards to um, confinement system or house systems, you know, we, we need that 12 plus hours of, of lying time. In a grazing system, we, we're actually quite comfortable at that eight um, hours of lying time, but every hour we get over that is increased production because it, a cow to ruminate needs to lie down. So we, we know that there's extra production associated to doing that. So there's a lot of, lot of um, opportunities for us. And, and the third one that, um, you know, the leading lameness lesion in the world is digital dermatitis. And again, because it's recorded, we have definitely got digital dermatitis within Australia and New Zealand. And it, it's, it's more likely it's, it's just unrecorded but um, there's been some really good localised research from Dairy Australia uh, and likes um, that actually has showed some pretty prominent um, lesions of digital dermatitis that is, is certainly prevalent over here. Put you on mute, Carl, sorry. Uh, should we open it up for some questions? See if yeah, the yeah, audience- Yeah, uh, we are open for questions, that's for sure. But there's nothing sort of popping through. So, um, but no, that's fantastic overview, Carl. It's uh, yeah, as as we we get further along these production lines and cows continue to escalate in production, which is what we're all trying to achieve is a, an efficient cow, um, which comes with efficiency is basically increased production. So, increased production, increased heat loads, all has impacts. And, and uh, you know, I, I guess uh, I, I've been in this field now for 30 years. And, and I remember in, you know, in the early 90s when I first started, you know, or, or the late 80s, you know, nobody, nobody, you know, we didn't know what was happening, you know, and we didn't know what was happening until probably Nigel Cook started doing some of the work here at Wisconsin. And, and that really opened up our eyes and, and, I mean, we did several trials that were never published, but because we had we had data we could look at, but but it was just interesting to see the 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 dynamics what would happen and 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 today what's 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 happening today with all the knowledge that we have with the what we do with cow cooling, it's just you know if if a farm in Saudi Arabia with twenty thousand cows can produce forty six liters of milk per cow. You know? Yeah, correct. And and Carl, like where America is in, in the Northern Hemisphere, where production is sitting ten and a half to eleven thousand liters average production. I mean, you go back to the nineteen eighties, where you were doing five thousand, six thousand liters. I mean, that's where Australia and New Zealand are, are still at, and that that's where we are now evolving to sort of following where your system's gone and and, and the production. We're all running the same genetics, 
that's all happening. So we've actually had one question come in um, from a client of ours in, in Southern Riverina. Um, just in regard, can you can you go over the physical maintenance trimming program again, Carl, and what we're trying to achieve out of that? Okay, so so you know basically, uh, let let's see here. We'll we'll go here. Uh, I'll do I'll do a, I'll do a new share here. And even with that, Carl, it's it's been fascinating, and you've been in this game for for such a time the evolution of of what trimming program and protocols and and where we're going and and, and the less is more like uh, you know we're not trimming the whole hoof and yeah. and yeah. taking everything yeah. off and it's little as possible now so 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 what it comes from is is you know we're understanding so much more I, I believe I know I understand a lot more about the anatomy about the claw function just because of all the learning and all the work that's come out in in the last in the last I would say five to eight years five to ten years you know and yeah. and one of the things here is is when you look at it getting that weight into the toe and from the anatomy what we have to understand is the toe has the strongest connection. Uh, suspension inside of the, inside of the claw, claw capsule because we have a hoof wall on both sides. So important thing, can you see? I don't go in between the toes. Uh, my colleague here is not going in between the toes with the grinder because that inside wall right here, right here, that's a really important wall. That's a, a, a pillar. And some of the new work that's come out of Sweden actually shows if we increase the angle uh, and and we we the medial claw is loaded the same way almost all the time. The weight is always on the hoof wall. But when we when it comes to the lateral claw, if we don't increase the angle and if we don't dish them out a little bit, now this is going to be a little bit different from grazing cows. With grazing cows, we wouldn't do this much. We we can do less unless you're feedlotting them. If you're feedlotting them, you're going to have to do a little bit more and. And the critical point here is when we do this, let me get quick here. I'm going to change to the pointer. Okay. Just, just on that, Carmen, that a lot of the reason why we're not doing that modeling so wide is because we've got such thin soles. We're, we're walking it's, the tread off. We don't actually have the depth to actually do that with that, uh, for that modeling. Exactly. And we can see that in, in the video over here as well. You know, on this one, we can see... There's not a lot of extra soles, but you look at the angle, it's probably 45 degrees, right? And just what he does, just standing him up, really important part. And, and for everybody, the most important part is to not create a thin sole. Like the farm I was today, there is a, probably a third of the cows, I couldn't take anything off the soles. All I could do is just the modeling. And that's with a very aggressive recycled sand. Okay, they have a very coarse recycled sand, but uh, no, no cows that I had to block because of thin soles today, and that's coming out of the summer. So we're gaining because we've been able to switch sand to a, a more not as aggressive as a sand, and and it's actually helped the wear. But so important that that uh, that we we from a function, and that's why it's important also for anybody, you know, before you hack away, don't. Don't go to YouTube videos because YouTube videos, ninety five percent of them will show over trimming. You know, and Carl, and, that, and, that, that and, video you've got there on the on the right. If you go back to where your hook to the seven trim rule is, you know, yeah, that, that set up the angle that we want, and it's been a fascinating development in evolution again of understanding this. That the way I'm using the the angle discussion is if you think about a freshly born calf. And that calf is standing up at 55 to 60 degree angle, you know, quite quite high yeah. on its toes. And then that that tool that you've developed um, with with through many iterations, you know, that that is such a critical part is that angle. Trying to step them back up and put all the weight bearing as we can into that toe triangle where all the suspensory system and blood vessels actually are. The the the, the thing here to probably add on is before I built that tool that we're looking at there is that you measure the angle. I did a whole bunch of research and there was one study done on six months old heifers in Germany from four different breeds. And they were looking at the back feet and actually in those six months old, six to seven months old 
female animals in Germany from four different breeds. The, the dorsal wall angles were between 57 and 61. Yeah. And I said, I said, why well, we're happy with 48? Because years ago, everybody said, well, 48 is pretty good. And it was adapted from the horses. Today, if I would do that tool again, I'd probably make it 55, even though it would be very difficult to do in a grazing situation. Okay, but the, the thing to understand for everybody is when we go to this picture, on, on heifers before the calf, the toes, the, the hoof walls are always long right here. Right here, they're always long, okay? If we can knock, you can see here, on this one, this uh, this is at a farm where I do, actually did a study on it. And before trimming, the angles were between 42 and 45. After trimming, by only taking not even halfway back on, into the heel, all the angles were over 52 when, when, when we measured them again with this study. It's okay. it's quite incredible, Carl, and and you you and I both know Professor Christoph Muehling and the research he's sort of done in regards to the hoof health space. And I remember a, a time in the US that I was with him, and uh, we we're actually doing some pressure place t pressure plate testing with cadaver feet, and just the slightest removal of horn, and just how much change that actually does to the pressure and the loading to the the areas that we actually want, which is out in that white line and then that toe triangle. It's, it's fascinating yeah. of, of where we're actually trying to take this to. So, so basically, and, basically what we want to do is we want to get the weight onto the hoof wall, which starts right here, and and then goes about a third of the way back. Now, you can see here on grazing cows, sometimes we don't have a hoof wall, okay, because because it's from walking on the, on the grass and on the dirt, and, and the research on, on the grazing cows actually come out a little bit different than on confinement. When we look at the next one, you can see here the ones in the free, raised in freestalls are completely flat across the toe triangles. Now we don't have and that. It's a great thing. point. It's a really okay. good point there, Carl, too. Just that grazing side, because we've got, you know, Australia, New Zealand and, and the UK and the likes and an island and likes in South Africa is, is we end up doing a lot less on these grazing yes. cows it's just purely because we don't have the horn to play with but everything we can do to get them into that toe triangle and change that angle is it's massive so that's been a great great uh um, differentiation between the house system and and where a lot of the information comes from is that house system so and 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 for, for all of you to remember is is for me the reason i have really good angles everywhere because every heifer is checked just like at this particular farm here Every heifer is checked before calving. And here you can see it. I only took off the inside claw. Stand them up. That inside claw is a little bit longer. Stand them up before calving and they have a good angle for the rest of the life. But if I let them go to the end of the first lactation, I've already lost the angle. The internal, the pedal bone already changed the inside and we can never get under the point where they, where they are anymore afterwards. So, so that prevention, it's kind of like, you know, greasing that, uh, greasing that hay bine or greasing the, the chopper before you go to the field with these heifers, you know, I would do it, you know, if I could have my choice, I would do it four to six weeks before or eight weeks before calving, you know? So yeah. if we get them, them a little bit thin, they don't have to walk the tracks the next day. I would never do them close to calving, but you know, especially when they come in the close-ups and for everybody to understand Every farm will be a little bit different, okay? Like every every barn will be a little bit different. And, and some places, like we get heifers from out west from the dry lots, there is nothing we can do. There's probably about 10% of the animals that need trimming, okay? Because, they, because of the environment they're in all the time. It's dry, they're eating on the concrete, uh, you know, and, and they have a, a good environment. But then, but then you look at some... Especially what I see sometimes is, uh, let's say, the Jerseys, the Blackfoot. We don't, it's a little harder. We know it's a little bit harder. They don't wear, there's more longer toed heifers on the Jersey breed, you know, and then there is in the Holsteins, you know. And, and so th that's something to keep in, uh, keep in mind as well. No, that's excellent, Carl. I think we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground there today, and really appreciate your time. Um, and thanks to everyone for joining in, and those that will look at this on on replay. 
Uh, but yeah, <clears throat> again, really appreciate your time, Carl. Uh, I think we'll we'll wrap it up. Um, any more, any further questions? Please come back to us. Um, we, we, we're certainly happy to help and provide these resources in the field. So, and that's part of my role in Australia is to actually help deliver uh, the comfort of care and the information that Carl and I discuss um, onto field. So please, please come back to us with any, any sort of questions. So again, thank you for your time and uh, we'll catch you uh, next time when you're out in the country, Carl. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. And well, that, that won't be too long, will it? No. Excellent. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And, and again, thanks for listening.